know about mercury and if you got feelings before with mercury uh it's definitely something to investigate and look into man it's some serious stuff man so i'm glad yeah. you took care of that brother oh good thanks i'm still taking care of it but um it's, i feel a lot um feel a, a lot better man you know you have to go through that little bit of pain in order to kind of you know um a deeper understanding of the outcome man, and looking down the road 20 years from now how that uh, mercury will affect you your mental state, your health, your eyesight, your breathing, your digestion. You know? Right. Yeah. So anyway. Indeed, man. Well, um, so much has been going on, Professor Griff, right. since you've been, since our last show. I mean, since Trump has taken office, I mean, this dude is moving lightning speed with certain things. It's like we would have to have a show every other day just to keep up with what's going on. Right, I mean, right, it's, right. it's 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 something that I'm sure even a person who anticipated Trump when what he would do, they would still be in a little a little bit surprised at what Trump did. And and when I say that, this is what I mean. Out of the blue, out of nowhere, Trump talks about the travel ban. Out of the blue, out of nowhere, no warning, nothing. He just implements this executive order. You in the middle of a flight, and as you're landing from the flight. You're mm. told that you're banned. You know, you you didn't get a 24 wow. hour notice. You didn't get 48 hours. You didn't get a week. I'm talking about as you're in the air and you come down, you get deported or something like that. I mean, it right, the right, things right. that he 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 talks about, and he does. I mean, it's wow. He he he's uh he, he's doing some stuff at at a fast rate here, and it, it's kind of funny. Uh, a quick personal experience that I just found kind of amusing. Uh, I want to share with the family. Um, about a week a week ago, probably like right after the travel ban, I think it was that same day or the next day, I'm in a cab. I'm taking a cab from Harlem to Brooklyn. It's late at night. I'm tired. Um, probably 1 in the morning. I'm with my queen. We go into Brooklyn. We get a cab. Uh, as we get to Brooklyn, the police pull, pulls over the cab. So I'm half asleep. My head is down. I got my hood over my head. My girl is sitting there, so we like, oh shit, what they what they pulling over the cab for? We got some stuff in the trunk that we took from Hall to Brooklyn, so we like, I do the, the the cop stops the car. As soon as he gets to the car, uh, he tells the cab driver to roll the window down. The cab driver says, uh, what you you want to look in the trunk? He he automatically thinks we got some shit in the trunk and that they they've been following us. The cops the cops say no, uh, roll down the back windows. So the mm. cab driver rolls down the back windows. The cop sticks his head almost in the window and says, are you guys okay? Is everything all right? I say, uh, yeah. They say, all right, have a good day. And, wow. right. and I'm like, well, when the hell has, I, I've never seen nothing like that. I've never seen, so the cab driver got offended. And he said, oh, fuck, Donald Trump, da 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 I just never, I've never, not to say that Donald Trump is going to be good on black people. No, I'm not saying that, people. I'm just sharing a good uh, 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 personal experience that I had that I found quite interesting because I've always been on the opposite end of the pole in which I'm the one being uh, uh, profiled. So it was, right. just, it was just weird to see and be in that position. And you know the history of cab drivers and being a cab and being black. So it was just real interesting. And I just wanted to share that personal experience. I don't know what memo is going on in the police precinct with the cab drivers and the immigrants, but it was just which is real interesting, to say, to say the least. But uh, mo moving on, uh, Professor Griff, a lot, a lot of black people, a lot of what we call African Americans, um, we have a unique experience with uh, white people and with white supremacy. One in which people feel as though we complain a little bit too damn much. We we're too we're ungrateful for what this country can provide. So when this travel ban happened, when this Muslim ban happened. Um, a lot of black people is like, man, fuck Islam, fuck the Muslims. Uh, uh, um, ain't nobody riding with us when we talking shit about white supremacy. You know, there, there, it's just where where a lot of black people I sense are not. Uh, there's, there's no there's there's no sympathy for what's going on. So mm -hmm. to start out with, what's your take on this Muslim ban that many people see as just a blatant form of racism, a blatant form of white supremacy, but at that same time, one in which many African-Americans don't give a damn about because we've been going through this shit 
forever, and nobody seems to care. So talk to me. Let's start out with this band, Professor Griff. Let's catch up. What's going on with this, brother? Well, I think it, it, it like like the personal experience that you and your queen had traveling from um, Manhattan to Brooklyn, I had a similar um, experience traveling from um, East Coast to the West Coast, from from the uh, D.C. area to um, to uh, L.A. You know, I get off the plane. I'm really tired. You know, that's a four or five hour trip. I get off the flight and they're going down to get my bags and, and um, TNV runs up on me. You know, understand with the camera in my face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they wanted to talk about the uh, the Muslim travel ban. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of reluctant about doing it, but, you know, I told them to wait because, you know, I had a couple of phone calls and make, make sure my ride was in place and that kind of thing. And uh, so I granted a, a five, ten minute interview, which ended up being 15 20 minutes, and uh, which they actually, if you saw the uh, final thing, they cut it up. Yeah, they, they kind of cut it up. So he's basically asking me about the travel, the Muslim travel ban. And I noticed now the language has changed. Mm. So now, if you listen to the news, um, you will hear um, not only TMZ, but the rest of the alphabet boys start to mention a refugee ban. Mm. Well, that wasn't the language. That wasn't the language that Donald Trump used. Mm -hmm. like, and like you, you said, he sprung that on the people. And when he sprung it on the people, it was basically based on his rhetoric um, when he was campaigning on what he was going to do. That's like him uh, starting to build a wall 3.30 tonight. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Without telling mm -hmm. it anymore. Um, with all we've exactly. heard about what he's yeah. going to do, but nonetheless, we didn't know that he wasn't going to go through the proper channels in which to get it done. Um, having to fire his uh, attorney general, because she was against it. Having uh, 18 to 24, I believe it's 36 now, active high-profile members of, that are Republican, that are in the government, oppose it. Entertainers are opposing it. Sports players oppose it. Um, doctors oppose it. Um, how about... Um, Students, foreign exchange students. How about doctors? How about uh, Americans that are abroad that travel with foreign students and foreign professors and teachers and instructors that are teaching white Americans can't get back in the country? Mm -hmm. So when, you, when you're talking about, we, we, can, we can't be now minded about this. When right. you're talking about implementing a ban now, you're talking about going against the very fabric and the grain of what America is supposed to stand for as far as their First Amendment rights and due process. The First Amendment basically states that of the United States government, uh, the United States Constitution, pardon me, prohibits the making of any law respecting um, an establishment of religion, um, ensuring that there's no prohibition uh, on the freedom to exercise your religion. You understand what I'm saying? So if, if right, you have right. the freedom of religion in America, um, then why would you impose a ban and sign off an executive order based on uh, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965? So they say, if you listen real close to their rhetoric, mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. basically what they're basically saying is Obama was the one that put this in place. Mm -hmm. And the same mm -hmm. people that you hear opposing it were the same people that voted to restrict and, and, and vet these, these particular uh, foreigners from coming in and out of America so freely. And then, of course, Fox News and the rest of them have to talk about it. It's only a temporary ban, I believe, of 120 days. But you know what that leads to? If you really look at the history of Nazi Germany, that mm. is the same exact thing that, that Nazi Germans, Germany tried to pull off. If you remember, if you go back and do the history, and, and we can. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Mm. Um, Nazi Germany tried to pull the same thing off, brother, which with, with going back and start to limit the travel on um, immigrants and this kind of thing. And it was the, basically the same kind of rhetoric, brother. This year. It was the same kind of moving against uh, foreigners, labeling foreigners. But we have to keep in mind, it was Trump that made this red hat that he used to wear very famous, talking about Make America White Again. If you really look at it, this is racism, white supremacy at its finest. Fine-tuning racism, white supremacy, and they're trying to make America great. 
by getting rid of all uh, the people that don't agree with, with, with what's white is right, all the people that don't, that's not full-blooded American, that, that are Christian, that eat apple pie and trade fucking baseball cards. You understand what I'm saying? They're getting rid of everyone. And then had the nerve to, to, to uh, point out and isolate seven individual <laughs> states that sponsor terrorism, which is a joke in and of itself because those are not even the type, top, top Islamic Muslim countries. Shows you how much he doesn't know about executive orders. <laughs> it says there's not a there's not a hashtag Muslim ban. It's a ban on the final remaining country without an IMF Rothschild central bank in it. <laughs> mm. Wow. Okay. Okay. So it's a lot deeper than what we're actually seeing on the surface, brother Rich. It's deeper than the whole Muslim thing you're saying. Right. Exactly. And I just wanted to kind of um, point that out. It says remember. It didn't start with gas chambers. The Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers. That was the end result, Brother Rich. Mm -hmm. It said it started with politicians dividing the people up, U.S. versus them. It started with intolerance and hate speech. And when, people's, uh, when people stopped caring, it became uh, desensitized. And it, they turned a blind eye, i.e. stop and frisk. Mm -hmm. People would walk by and say, okay, well, it's not happening to me, so... Right. So what for the right. average dude that's dressed like a hood in Harlem? If he gets stopped and frisked, he deserves it. But as soon as they get rid of those brothers, they're going to they're gonna turn on you. So what's the difference? Mm. And last but not least, to answer that question, Brother Rich, <clears throat> everyone that's listening to my voice needs to understand what is an executive order. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You know, Griff, do, does, you know, we always hear about, um, you know, politics is fake and, you know, they're all on the same team. And we see the pictures with Trump, Hillary, Bill Clinton, um, all of them. We see, we see pictures with Al Sharpton with Trump. We see pictures with all of them together smiling and laughing all the time, all the presidents. We mm -hmm. see pictures of them smiling. But then when it's time for election, they're fighting and they act like they hate each other. A lot of people feel as though this time they really dislike Trump. They feel as though this time Trump, this is something, this, this is some real infighting going on. It's not staged. It's not a play. It's not acting going on. When Charles Schumer was crying, Trump said, oh, those are fake tears. I know him. You know, Trump just, you know, he's, everything is fake to him. Fake news, fake tears, fake everything to him. So he's like, oh, Charles Schumer, that's fake. I don't believe him. I know him. He's not a crier. And people's like, no, these people are really against him. Are you rethinking what you may have thought before about politics as far as everybody being a part of the same team? Or do you think there's some real infighting going on at this time with Trump and what he, his, his, because at the end of the day, we can say it's white supremacy, but. Do you think Trump has his own version of white supremacy that they don't agree with? And you hit the, you hit the nail on the head. Not only his own version, but he's actually carrying out a particular uh, ideology inside of the, the, the particular camps. Don't get me wrong. Um, I've never believed most of what you just said in the first place because this is the reason why they knocked off Reagan. Well, they tried to. They knocked off the Kennedy boys. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll kill their own leaders if they don't if they don't participate and if they don't fall in line with the overall agenda is. Mm -hmm. And most people are thinking that that's what's going to happen to Donald Trump. Um, he's not going to make it through the first few years of his presidency. Um, in the first twelve days, I believe he signed uh, fifteen or so uh, executive orders. Mm -hmm. Which is mm. unprecedented and, yeah, and yeah. it's basically unheard of. Right, um, right, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, A young person would, would basically say, well, you know, who does that? You understand what I'm saying? We mm. start talking about executive orders by presidents, if you do the history, uh, per year. Barack Obama, 33.57 uh, executive orders. George Bush at 36.38. Bill Clinton, 45.5. Um, George Bush, the first one was George W. Bush. This was George Bush the idiot, 
41.5. Reagan, 47.63. Jimmy Carter, which had the most, 80 executive orders. I'm talking about, we're talking about per year now. Right. So it may be executive orders that we, that we didn't, uh, that we're not familiar with. More that they're adding on, some of which we know. Gerald Ford, 68.9. For the young people that's listening, you probably don't know who Gerald Ford is. Just Google these people. Um, executive orders by presidents, the average per year. Richard Nixon, 62.3 for Lyndon Baines Johnson, um, 62.8 and John F. Kennedy, 75.35. So when you start talking about executive orders, Donald Trump, he has almost 15 to 20 in, in 12 days. So on that average, Brother Richard, oh, man. at that average, <laughs> you can imagine what he's going to end up with. But some of these things in reference to these policies, pardon me, not things, these policies in reference to um, travel bans and, 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 and people being detained and, and temporary travel bans um, um, was put in place by George Bush. So Barack Obama um, basically was probably one of the uh, worst ones that kind of had a issue with foreign policy. Because as you know, they'll tell you, you'll see it online right now. No one said anything when Barack Obama was bombing these same countries, these same seven countries that were outlined by, um, by um, Donald Trump. And they weren't necessarily outlined by Donald Trump. When you're talking about, when you're talking about um, um, the, uh, what was it, March 07, the interview um, that serves as a reminder regarding the diabolical timeline of America's um, hegemonic project. Now, listen, Brother Rich, and I'm sure you heard General Wesley Clark say this. He said, it is worth noting that six out of, the, of these seven countries that were mentioned, with the exception of Lebanon, identified by General Wesley Clark to be taken out. This is his language on national right. TV. Right, right. To be taken mm -hmm. out are now the object of President Trump's ban on Muslims entering the United States. Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Sudan, Iran, and Yemen. Now, if you take that list and you do a simple Google Wikipedia uh, for research, you'll know that those are not the top American, I mean, top Muslim countries. Mm -hmm. When you put that next to Indonesia and other places, which have more Muslims in it. Then when you start having a further deeper conversation about terrorism, you have to talk about homegrown terrorism, Brother Rich. Out of the 100 people, I think I wrote it down somewhere, out of the 100 people that they arrested for ISIS-related crimes of terrorism, 85% of those people are American white people. Wow, 85%? 85%. Woo. <laughs> homegrown terrorism, man. You told my white boys that are fed up with America going right. to join ISIS and trying to come back into the United States. White people. White people shooting up schools. White people shooting up movie theaters. White people are doing this. So when General Wesley Clark talks about um, at the highest level in, in, at the Pentagon and the State Department and, um, and these other places, they're talking about taking out um, seven countries in five years. Mm. This is this is this is this is when Trump comes along and puts a ban on it. He's only following orders. He's only following through what they've already said. I believe people are getting they're already frustrated with him. They don't like him, and I think when he does stuff like this very abruptly, it speaks to his character. He wants it to happen right now. If it was left up to Trump, with no black people or foreigners be in America. And guess what? White people are the foreigners. Mm. If you ask the Native American. Right, right. So when you start talking about illegal Im immigrants must go, I'm hearing this chant from white people, illegal immigrants must go, the Native Americans can turn around and say, oh, you serious? Okay, so when y'all going to leave? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the reality of it, Brother Rich. See, man, this, at this the is same what? time, at the same damn time, Russia is affecting the election. <laughs> they won't put a ban on Russia. <laughs> Won't put a, ain't that something? Russia got his hands all in American politics, man. But they won't 
they won't put sanctions on Russia. <laughs> wow. Mm-mm-mm. See, see, this is why the people got to hear Professor Griff, man, every week, man. The, the stuff oh, get thanks, man. The first 20 minutes is explosive, my brother. Explosive. <laughs> oh, Yo, let me, let me, can I give people that, that Immigration Act so they can look it up? It's the Immigration yeah. and Nationality Act of yeah. 1965. House Resolution Bill 2580. Uh, so if they could just look that up, it's the Immigration and Nationalization Nationality Act of 1965. Maybe you want to put it up to show the people. Indeed, right? Yeah. Okay, so Professor Griff, um, you know, you know, we're talking about you know the word executive orders keeps keeps coming up uh, in this conversation. We're talking about uh, what Trump has done, you know, in comparison to past presidents, what he has done with in such a short amount of time. My question to you would be, Professor Griff, coming off the heels of the what we call the first black president, going into Trump and seeing how mm. Trump moves, seeing how Trump disrespects the media, disrespects who just disrespects damn near everybody that disagrees with him or even agrees with him. Um, disrespects his own wife in front, you know, uh with, yeah. with his body language. So yeah. well, with, with all that in consider is, is is Trump with all that into, into consideration? Is Trump making Obama look like a pussy? Somebody that we wanted to do so much for black people in eight years didn't manage to do anything, and this is man Trump going so hard for white supremacy within this first month. Does does that look, does that make Obama look like more of a pussy than what people might have thought he was to begin with? No, not and at no, all. No, 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 dis- and no disrespect to Obama. That's just a, right. You know, yeah. and, and, and like I said, no, not at all. It makes Obama look very classy, very okay. distinguished gentleman, very uh, presidential-like, um, uh, almost royalty status. Mm. If you sit, if you compare and sit him down next to a Donald Trump, right? Uh, it almost makes Obama look godlike, and that is the deceptiveness in the smoke and mirror kind of illusion that racism, white supremacy gives off. Okay. That any time a black man is moved in any kind of position of authority, um, white people have to come along and let people know that we're actually in charge. We, when Barack, oh, I'm not Barack Obama, when Donald Trump you um, watched his body language and his facial expression when he mentioned the Patriots winning the Super Bowl. You could almost read the body language and say, this is a strike for white America to establish themselves, the ultimate superior white man to establish themselves over the dark-skinned people of the planet. This right. is a strike and a blow for, uh, for racism, white supremacy. We always knew he was superior. This was this was a, a victory of the white man over the black man, because the, uh, even though there's black people on the Patriots, and they're very good players, but if you look at the two particular teams, it's almost polarized. The Falcons wore a darker color. The Falcons from Atlanta, which uh, people say is, uh, is the next chocolate city. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, Atlanta versus New England. When you even think of old ass New England, you think white people. <laughs> mm-hmm. And this is the the the, the the, uh, the the thinking, not the overall thinking, but the thinking of white people that next morning when they woke up. We got Donald Trump in place as president. The Patriots won. Shit, good, man. We can fucking do this, man. Fucking do this. I'm like, wow. For real? Okay. Walking, and, walking through the airports and traveling uh, on and off college campuses and this kind of thing, listening to white people. As, as I as I walk by the newsstand, and I may stop and read some stuff, have a few conversations with the people on the plane. It's like wow, this is almost like white people having to have that 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 movie that they have to put out every year to make the white man seem superior. Right, right. If it was left up to uh, James Baldwin uh, with the movies that he just put out, but they just put out based on on his work. Yeah, uh, I'm not a Negro. That's a very dynamic film. I don't see how white people could wake up the next morning feeling superior. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? After an explosive movie like that coming out. 
I yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's in the movie theaters? Uh, that's in the theaters right now. Okay, I got to see that. Okay. See, you're not going to find 49 commercials every two hours. Right, right. You're yeah, not going to yeah. find a million-dollar commercial in the middle of the Super Bowl. Yeah. Half time. You know what I'm It's too black. Mm-hmm. It's too strong. Too black. Too strong. For real. And, and, and when you sit and watch that 90-minute uh, masterpiece that they put together, you can watch that, and a lot of the footage is black and white, and it'll roll your mind back. But sitting in the movie theater, you're like, wait a minute, that shit is happening right now. Mm. When you start to see the placards and the signs, I'm going to go back to your own country and all this kind of stuff. Right. So the very real dynamic that's going on in America, and I think basically Donald Trump is just doing the remix, man. Mm. Okay. Yeah, if, you, if you really start to look at the, <laughs> well, the uh, language that they use, uh, uh, Islamic ban, first of all, you and I have had this conversation before, this particular language of racism, white supremacy. The coded Islamist. language? Islamist. The, is, the trigger words. The code trigger words. Word. Right, okay, okay, okay. The Islamist. The Islamic terrorists. The Muslim Islamist terrorists. <laughs> I said to myself, wow, they putting them words together, man. <laughs> mm. So then when you do some basic research, and you say, wow, America, in their... Um, what do you call these um, these people that get together, these think tanks that they fund millions of dollars through and in, come up with these terms, and then they pass that information on to the media, and the media beats you down with these terms as far as repetition is concerned. And you hear black people using the same damn terms. Don't know what the hell they're talking about. What the hell is an Islamist? Right. <laughs> what, 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 what is that? Do you call white men from America that commit uh, terrorist acts, do you call them Christian terrorists? <laughs> but as soon as someone that's darker commits one of those crimes, automatically they're a Muslim terrorist. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the countries that they mention are low on the totem pole as far as Muslims are concerned. It's just Islam by country. That's a basic Google search. Around 62% of the world's Muslims live in, in the Asia-Pacific region from Turkey to Indonesia. Did you hear what I just said? Mm-hmm. It's got nothing to do with these places that, that, that uh, Donald Trump mentioned. Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Libya, Sudan, Iran, and Yemen. So come on, man. The largest Muslim population in, the, in, the, uh, in a country, uh, is in, um, in, the, in the world, pardon me, is in Indonesia. A nation home of 12.7% of the world's Muslim population is right there in Indonesia and, and in Pakistan. So, but if you're going to impose a ban, uh, and even if it's a Muslim ban, I noticed they changed the language, it's a refugee ban. You claim that Saudi, uh, uh, a certain percentage of the hijackers and the terrorists that brought down the Twin Towers were from Saudi Arabia. How come you don't put the ban on them? How come you don't impose sanctions on Saudi Arabia? No, because you want that oil money. And mm. most of the seven okay. countries that I mentioned, Brother Rich, there's oil in Libya. They, re- they want to set up military camps in Somalia. There's oil in, in the Sudan. They want to set up a beachhead there in Iran so they, can, so they can continue to control the Middle East. And, and it behooves me, and it's way beyond my research. I'm still trying to figure out why they want Yemen. I know why they want Syria. Yeah, yeah. If you understand the grand chessboard, according to um, uh, the big Brzezinski, I understand mm-hmm. why they want Iraq. Mm-hmm. But Yemen, I can't figure it out. But they said it themselves. They're going to take <laughs> out. They're going to take out seven countries in five years. Let me tell you something, man. North Korea is going to be a thing of the past. Your might as well take all the goddamn pictures now. You understand? That place ain't going to be there. Mm. And if you let Israel get away with it, they'll, they'll nuke it, Iran. And they have the capability to do that. So we better be very mindful of the language that in the meetings that Donald, Donald Trump is having with these people, man. Meeting with Netanyahu, uh, having these talks with um, uh, Putin. And who he's putting in place as far as his cabinet is concerned. 
Man, there's a damn sideshow of people that he's uh, pointing to these particular offices, man. It is a sideshow, Brother Richie. Mm. And you would think with 250 to 500,000 women marching on the, on the White House lawn, you understand what I'm saying? You would think that he would get the message. He's oblivious to, to what's going on. But as you see, what we talked about last year, Brother Rich, actually implementing these things. Did you hear recently today that they said that they're using the facial recognition software? I didn't hear Track that. down the people who, who threw the Molotov cocktail that burned up the limousine? Wow. No, I didn't hear that. No. Yeah, what they're doing is they're, um, I think I put it up on my Facebook page. They'll take a picture. Someone will take a picture. They'll do the facial recognition software and track that person down. They can track you down by you putting up the peace sign on the picture and, and blowing up the picture of your uh, your fingerprint, Brother Rich. That's why I keep telling these brothers, they keep flashing these guns with this gunplay on YouTube and Facebook, man. You know, freeze that frame and zero in on that serial number and track that weapon down and come knock and kick them black boots and be kicking down your door. For real, man. Hmm. We better be mindful, seriously. We know we know of certain executive orders that Donald Trump has signed. What about the ones we don't know about, Brother Rich? Right, right. I'm talking about these internment camps. What is an executive order? Let's just get that out the way. Executive orders, which are EOs, are legally binding orders given by the president acting as the head of the executive branch to the federal administrative agencies all right, executive orders are generally used to direct federal agencies and officials in their exec execution, pardon me, execution of congressionally established laws or policies. This is why he had to fi uh, fire the attorney general. Mm, okay. Fire the executive order. And she said, "No, this is not. This is not according to the Constitution. You can't do this." Mm -hmm. He said, "You're fired." Like his ass is on a reality show, The Apprentice. Right, right. Come on, bro. Crazy, this is crazy. real life, man. Yeah. And most people stood up with her. She says, no, I'm not going to blindly follow this guy into the abyss. No, I'm going to execute um, um, the, what I've been putting in office to do. And no, I'm not going to just I'm not going to just sign off on these things. I'm going to study them and make sure they're within inside the confines uh, of the law. But she was fired. I believe her name was Yates. But notice he's moving every, the pieces in the right place. He's moving people in and out of position. He don't want any opposition in a minute to anything that he's going to do down the road. Right, his first yeah. year is just clearing the house, Brother Rich. You know that, right? Yeah, it seems that way, right? Yeah. Yeah, the first year is clearing the house, clearing, clearing putting the people house. in place. And the second year is like, okay, we're ready to start implementing some of these things. To be honest with you, from what I'm seeing, just from my narrow minded kind of military science perspective here. Trump wants to be a wartime president, man. I'm going to say this again in English. And I'm going to say it slow. So some of the flunkies that are listening could, could hear me. Because I know they're listening. He wants to be a wartime president. Trump wants to be at war. And the people he wants to be at war with are the same people that he's going to need to be his allies after the war is over. He wants to wage war on Islam. Plain and simple. Plain. Well, and simple. well, let me let me ask you that. Why is he? Why? Why is he so infatuated with Islam? Why does he want to wage wage war on Islam? Some people feel as though Islam is a cold word for black people. Some people feel as though that is for oil. I mean, there's all types of theories going out there. But why does it? Why is this man so infatuated? with Islam at this time. If you really look at Donald Trump, Donald Trump is the, the epitome of the average white America American that truly believes America is white people's country, which it is not. Donald Trump is the epitome of your average white boy growing up, all right, not really experiencing, having the experience of dealing with other cultures. He's very narrow-minded when it comes to culture. Donald Trump is the epitome of that average white boy that kind of grew up um, privileged. You understand know what I'm saying? This is how come he can parade around the country, start companies, bankrupt them, 
beat people out of their money, grab pussy, talk shit, threaten people, and nothing ever happened to them. This is your average white boy. Look at them. Look at the white boys on Fox News. They're the same way. Right, right. <laughs> Cocky, arrogant, um, egotistical, sociopath, psychopath. You understand what I'm saying? This why he talk, he's talking about he'll ask, go he'll bomb some people and ruin people's career. You hear his language? His language is childlike. Like a like he's a twelve year old. Yeah, yeah. So the other thing now we have to keep in mind. You right. When you hear Islam, uh there are a lot of black people that are Muslim in in this country that was born in this country. When you start talking about and, and, and start doing the research with the amount of black people that converted from Christianity to Islam, just with the five percent nation of God and earth. You understand what I'm saying? When you're talking about going to war with a, a, a foreign country that's Muslim, of course you have to think domestic and foreign policy. How are you going to deal with Muslims in America while going to war, going to war with Muslims outside of America in a foreign country? God forbid that they get together and, and, and lock arms and they fight against America. America's going to have two wars on their hands. A civil war in America with Muslims and Islam and, and having to entertain the theater of war outside of America. And that's hard to do, Brother Rich. That's, that's hard to do. And then on top of that, what about the homegrown terrorists that America made? Right, and this is a very real dynamic that America right now, especially with Trump in office, are having to sit back and say, "Okay, we got to play our cards right. We can't beat everybody's ass on the planet." Plain and simple. Well, let me ask you this, hmm? Professor Griff. With all of that being said, so much talk is uh, being. I, I'm hearing so much talk about Steve Bannon, which Trump named the head of national security. And some people say that's Trump's handler. Some people are saying that this is the guy that's running the country. And some people, and this man, people are saying is a flat-out, hardcore racist. This man is, I mean, when you're talking about them all-American classic white boys, this is the man that fits the bill. This is the man that you're talking about when you're thinking about this all-American white boy racist. Steve Bannon is this man. And people are baffled by it with his with his lack of experience. How did he get this job that, that Trump no, uh, nominated him to, that Trump appointed him to? I'm sorry. Uh, how did he get this position with this lack of experience? So what do you, what, what's your take? Uh, Professor Griff, on Steve Bannon and everything that you've heard and you've read about him and the position he's in right now in this country. Well, you know something, Brother Rich, when I first heard that, um, I've heard his name before, didn't really pay attention, but when I heard that, I said, okay, what's with this guy? And I started studying, and I said to myself, okay, wow, uh, he has a little to do with American politics, but now he's thrusted himself in it, he's probably had a lot to do with uh, a lot of what's been going on behind the scenes. But for Donald Trump to put a man like this, who was not afraid to let you know his position on certain things, yeah. but to put him as the president's chief strategist, yeah. so let's run down some basic things. Because I know people say, well, who is this guy? Because yeah. some people may not want to do the research, but it just it just uh, puts my conscience and 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 uh, it kind of um what's the terminology they say you uh, uh um it kind of moved me to the point where I had to figure out who this cat is. Mm -hmm. So Bannon is the executive chairman of the Brett Bar News. Let's mm -hmm. say let's call it an agency. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a website. For the alt right, that's just number one. Now let's get that straight. Can we get that straight real quick? Mm -hmm. Right wing, ultra white people, super white boys, 
who don't give a fuck about nothing but themselves. White is right. Bannon is the one leading the charge, him and Trump. Right. So they've always been in bed together. If not physically, they've had the same mindset. All right? So when you talk about the Brett Bart News, a website for the alt-right, you see what we see when Donald Trump took office. The alt right came out of the closet instantly. Yeah, yeah, instantly, yeah, yeah. And this dude was one of the ones leading the charge. Now for Trump to turn around and make him a chief strategist, wow, we in trouble, man. We are in trouble. Um, not that we were already in trouble, but when you look at this guy's history, we start talking about white nationalism. When you're talking about the amount of offensive headlines and everything that they cite, along with, according to the Southern Poverty um, Law Society, the site promotes racist and anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant ideas and has been accused of white nationalism. I'm talking about the Citizens Council. I'm talking about the seed. I'm talking about all these white boys you see on TV with the, the number 88 carved into they, their heads and, and tattooed on their arms. If you don't know what 88, the number 88 signifies, as far as the Ku Klux Klan, it stands for Heil Hitler. 88. The number 88. Mm. It's in my book, Symbology. I talk about that. But when you talk about this dude and his, uh, they said that he started a non-profit to investigate politicians so that he can aid and help Trump move certain people out of the way so, it, so Trump can have a clear line to establish the kind of government that he want to see happen in America, whether Trump is president or after Trump. Trump really thinks he's going to be there eight years, by the way. Let me move real quick. He served in the United States Navy, all right? I don't know if you know Navy men, black Navy men to come tell you them horror stories about what goes on in the Navy, everything from hazing to everything else. They said that he, um, that, um, not not bragging about not ever having white or uh, black friends. Mm. Now, even in the position that you and I are in, I, I, I can't even make that statement. I can't say I've never had white friends. You understand know what I'm saying? Mm. I have white friends to this day. Some people say, okay, what you doing with white friends? Cut that out, man. You understand know what I'm saying? Maybe you operate with your white friends different than the way I operate with mine. That's another story for another time. This is the same man that that became a huge admirer of Ronald Reagan, who talked about and called Jimmy Carter a peanut farmer and said uh, and how Jimmy Carter fucked up the government. This is his words in his language, not mine. Mm -hmm. You understand? Um, Bannon worked at the investment uh, banking firm of Goldman Sachs. Look at Goldman Sachs when it comes to who the Illuminati is. So you talk about a person that was almost... Um, groomed for uh, a nationalistic approach on how they want to run the government. I'm kind of hesitating because I want to be careful about how I lay this out, Brother Rich. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, basically, they have no, they said there's no place in politics. They, their mindset, they didn't say it, but their mindset says there's no place in politics, especially in a higher echelon of government for women. And you know they weren't talking about black women because they don't want to. They don't even think about black women uh, having anything to do. So I don't know how he's going to deal with Omarosa being up in there. Notice when Black History Month started and Donald Trump's first day of Black History Month, he didn't even know who Frederick Douglass was, man. But you got man. Omarosa and Ben Dover Carson sitting next to you. <laughs> ben Dover Carson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is real, man. When you really look at this, this, this guy and how he operates, he was charged with domestic abuse. Well, isn't that ironic? Donald Trump went around grabbing pussies, and this dude was charged with domestic abuse. Both of them are like, they're like mine, man. They get yeah. down together like that. Yeah. His ex-wife accused him of being anti-Semitic. So we know he might have issues with Jewish people. But that's just some of the things about this cat, man. You understand know what I'm saying? Uh, he went so far as to uh, regu regularly, on a regular basis, attack Planned Parenthood, and he goes so far as to compare their work with the Holocaust. So, he don't like women, man. 
Not at all. Mm. The only right that he feels a woman should have is the right to listen to a man and, and have a man tell a, a woman what to do. Mm. So, so yeah. with, with, with all of that, uh, once again... Can, can that, I just say one last thing? Yeah, to put the cap on that? Yeah. See, we can read about a man like that. How about the ones, Brother Rich, that are there, that Trump surrounding himself with, that keep their stuff hidden, Brother Rich? Yeah. That's a scary yeah. thing, man. The ones mm. we don't know about. Right. His stuff is yeah. on Front Street. Mm -hmm. But anyway. So just considering that, Professor Griffin, mm -hmm. Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and for all those who live in New York, we know about Rudy Giuliani and his policies and his thoughts when it comes to black, uh, black people, brown people, whatever you want to call us, uh, whatever term you want to use. This is an obvious white supremacy all-star team. I mean, like, he yeah. brought out the top white supremacy all-stars he could find, and he put them together, and they got their all-star team. But at the same time, people look, unlike the other, uh, our past presidents, Obama, uh, Bush, um, Reagan, um, Clinton, people look at Trump as being anti-establishment, even with, with, with how his attack on the media. I've never heard a president come at the media the way Donald Trump comes at the media. So it, it comes out as a little confusing. Why, Professor Griff? Because in one, in, one, in one moment you're saying this man has a white supremacy all-star team, but in another moment you're saying this man is fighting against the white supremacy establishment, the same thing you're fighting against. So why would Professor Griffin and Donald Trump be fighting against the same establishment if you're for your people and Donald Trump is for white supremacy? It gets kind of confusing. Professor Griffin, try to explain that. Well, it's very, it's very difficult to explain it, especially in layman's terms, simply because Donald Trump is not fighting. He's not fighting the same establishment and then the establishment media that, that I would normally fight and work against and speak against. Um, I think what he's doing basically is saying that, okay, if you are going to take the position that you're, that you're taking, take the position totally. You understand? Don't take it partially. Don't say that on one hand, you want to be so much of a foreign-loving, Muslim-loving, Islamist-loving country that you'll invite anyone in, but at the same time, you will allow people like Slick Willie and Bill Clinton and these kind of people to put laws in place that's doing the same thing that I'm telling you I'm going to do outright. Mm. You follow what I'm saying? Trump right, is saying, right. look, I'm saying it outright. <laughs> if you want to come against me, you knew Bill Clinton was doing the same thing and you didn't come against him. Mm. Okay, okay. So, so, okay. so if I could, it, it, it is clear that way. Definitely, definitely. Okay, cool. So we need to understand that Donald Trump is saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You should be putting me on the front page of every newspaper. <laughs> See, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson said it. <laughs> Donald Trump, basically, she said, is going to be the president of the United States, and white people are going to hoist him up on their shoulders and say, you know something? White racism and white supremacy needs to rule because in our psyche, it's the only way we're going to be able to survive this genetic annihilation. And they fear. Mm. You see, you see, you look in their eyes when they talk about Muslims and Islam. Yeah, they yeah. fear it because they know that's 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 one a uh, 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 one way ticket out of here. Because what it does, it, it 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 ignites the militant propensity in young black men and Muslims across the country because Muslims will die on what they what they believe. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. And they fought against those Muslims. With, um, in, uh, Russia fought against those Muslims in the Mujahideen and in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and Afghanistan and all these other places. So they know the, the Muslim warriors are fierce, man. They don't want to go up against that, man, inside and outside of America. They don't want to have to deal with that. Yeah. So they're going to put things in place to just to kind of slowly kind of deal with this uh, Islamist, Muslim terrorist situation, that's the code word for, for, for ultimately getting, uh, getting in the trenches and having to deal with 
not only black people in America, but foreigners coming, foreigners coming into the country. Because you and I both know, Brother Rich, America's bought, paid, and, and sold off already. You know that. The roads, the bridges, um, buildings, all kind of things. They, they're selling America like America's up for sale. Google that, man. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. America's up for sale, man. They're selling America off. So when they say make America great again, how are you going to do that when China owns part of America, when foreign governments own part of America, when foreign agencies uh, own part, uh, part of America? You know, it's all of the people, all of the countries that he listed, which was seven of them. He didn't put Saudi Arabia on that list because he's still in bed with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Still making money. Got backdoor deals going on with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So come on, man. And some of them, some of those fake wannabe conservatives trying to play like they liberal white boys that are up on the hill, uh, up on Capitol Hill, in and around the White House, trying to play like... They're really trying to fight against Donald Trump, but secretly they really want him to succeed. <laughs> this is how they're moving. If you watch them and you listen to them real close, well, we need to give this, this presidency a chance. Well, what are you talking about, man? What are you talking about when he wakes up, uh, wakes up one one day, one morning, and he says, "Ah, I'm gonna we're gonna put a ban on a temporary ban on all these people coming into the country. Just ban them. Don't let them in." Wow, what's next? You're going to start opening up the uh, concentration camps, the FEMA camps? Mm -hmm. You start detaining black people? That's, that's, that's coming right down the pipe, man, in a minute. I got two more questions for you, Professor Griff. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of, you know, in, in what you're talking about right now, and Donald Trump and his Make America Great Again or his, America first policy, and we have to put America first before every other country. I, I I think about, you know, my life, and I think about my experience in this country, and I think about, it immediately made me think about how frustrated people get, not just white people, but black people as well. Well, obviously, I've had much more experience with black people, so it's uh, a lot of experience with black people when they get frustrated, very frustrated, when they're trying to conduct business. They make a phone call. They're trying to pay a bill. Um, they're trying to order something. They're going to the store. They want to inquire about a certain product. And the person on the other end does not speak good English. Mm -hmm. The person doesn't understand English. And most of the time, the person doesn't give a fuck about understanding English because they're just there to get a paycheck send the money back to the damn country and go back to wherever the fuck they came from. So it's something that not just white people get frustrated at. It's something a lot of black people get frustrated at. Like, man, what the fuck? The first thing they will say, Professor Griff, is I can't go to their country and not know how to speak their language. I got to know how to speak that shit in their country in order for me to be successful. But they could come to America and not speak a lick of English and become a millionaire. So with that being said, that alone makes people resonate with Trump to a certain extent when he says, make America great again or put America first. So, you know, just considering all that, it, it, is that something you get frustrated with living in this country and people don't speak a lick of English or you, they don't understand you when you're trying to conduct business? Is that something that you personally want to change in this country? Yeah, I really want to change. I really want to change that, brother Rich. And when I and let me let me explain that. I want to change the fact that white people try to uh, they stole our language from us and they try to force <laughs> English down our throat. But when we call, <laughs> just about credit card over the phone, they can't even speak proper English. <laughs> I want to change that, man. I really do. I want white people to get their act together for real, man. Oh, man. <laughs> because I swear, I hate, I, you know, all of us, all of us, you know, especially those of us that are my age, we've managed to make a little bit of money and pay some bills. And now we have to start paying our bills online and from your cell phone. And, you know, to be honest with you, um, and I'm going to be very transparent and very blunt with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't like it when I get someone on the phone that speaks 
has broken English or some small ass crack at 7-Eleven that just want to run his mouth and talk down at me and not mm. put the change in my hand, but put it on a, uh, but put it on, on the counter. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So I want to be able to, I want to change that dynamic. I want to change that dynamic when I have to go deal with these country crackers mm. and a white woman, poor Jennifer. I'm not going to mention her last name because I don't want to think I'm calling her out. She sent me an uh, email and said, uh, I only use the word cracker to inflame and, ign and ignite black people into a frenzy kind of kind of thing. I'm, I don't do that, Jennifer. And I have to explain to you one more time, like I explain to white people every single time they ask, the term cracker is a title. It's not a name. It's not name calling. You understand what I'm saying? The title, the, the, the cracker was the title of the man that cracked the whip on the plantation. When someone needed to get beat, they would call the cracker. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And, yeah. but because we go to the root of what these terms mean, and now we have to turn around and now explain them to white people, it's like we're being smart asses. You understand what I'm saying? Right. No, yeah. But, yeah. But you see, the average white person is not smart. If you do this, this uh, the, the research, and you look at the uh, statistics, and you compare um, young whites in America as far as math and science and, and geography and history, and you put them next to people from foreign countries, America probably is about 98 on the list, man. Okay. And, and that's real. So we have to understand that particular dynamic. So when you're talking about, do I get frustrated when I get someone on the line where I got to pay a bill or I'm ordering something and they can't speak proper English? Yeah, that may frustrate me at the moment. But thinking deeper than that, I get frustrated knowing that I can't speak one lick of any language coming off the continent, man. Out of 1,000 different languages that are there on the African continent, I can't read, write, and speak one. That's what I'm frustrated about. Wow. And then um, um, them wanting to establish uh, America as the primary language across the globe. Stop that, man. Some of them damn straw hat bearing ass, snag a tooth ass crackers that voted for Trump can barely speak English, man. Mm. I'm talking about the kind of cracker that have to sign his name with his whole fist. <laughs> I'm talking about grass. I'm talking about grab the whole goddamn pencil. <laughs> like you're a caveman. I'm like, come on, man. Yeah. For real. Yeah. So, yeah, it, 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 it's uh, almost godlike when you see what black people have done with a third and fourth grade education. Elijah Muhammad with with a eighth grade education. Malcolm. You understand what I'm saying? Um, what we're able to do, not only in this country, but throughout the world, what we've survived. No other people could do this, man. No other people. Indeed. Well, well, well I, got, I got one more question for you, Professor Griff, to close out the show. One more question. And for those, I'm going to throw this up uh, Wednesday morning. So for those listening, me and Professor Griff will do another show Wednesday night. Since right. we missed two weeks, we will do another show tomorrow night. I'm going to talk to Griff tomorrow about what we're going to talk about. But we do, we will do a show tomorrow night. I don't know. Tomorrow night might be live. I might try to do the live thing again and take a few calls from the people. I'm not sure yet. But we will do another show tomorrow night, 11 or 12 o'clock. So you can tune in again uh, to get to get the next show. Why don't we do 11 o'clock tomorrow night, and why don't you open up so we can take some calls? Man, to kind of okay. Guess. Okay, so y'all heard that. So for those that's listening, Wednesday morning, this is going to be uploaded Wednesday morning, we will be live Wednesday at 11 p.m., and we're going to go live and take a few calls um, during that show. Um, I, like I said, I'm going to talk to Griff tomorrow morning. Me and him, we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about. Don't know yet, but we will take a couple of calls live. Uh, with that being said, to close out the show, Professor Griff, do you uh -huh. think Donald Trump, with everything that this man has done, everything that's being said about him, do you think he's going to make 
four whole years without getting impeached, Professor Griff? Well, I think they're working right now to hit him with so many lawsuits that mm -hmm. the, the ultimate plan that he came into um, this presidency with, I don't think he's going to be able to carry out those particular things. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the thing that it's doing, Brother Rich, it is laying the base and dropping the seeds in these other young whites that are now coming up, Brother Rich. Right, right, okay. Because that alt right was laying dormant. It was, yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> so we have to understand the seeds that he's planting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So he may not pull it off. You see, you got to understand, we always talk about how white people stay four and five steps ahead. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's how we have to start thinking. The seeds that he's planting now. So even if he gets impeached, because you see the moves that, that, that Pence is making, right? Yeah. If something happened yeah. to Trump, Trump gets impeached, Pence steps up in that spot, what you think is going to be worse? Because mm. he's a slick devil. Mm. I mean, a real slimy, slick one, man. If you really watch him, let me mm -hmm. not get like above my... But anyway... <laughs> um. We have to be careful and, and continue to think chess instead of checkers. Mm -hmm. So even if the second year Donald Trump is out of there, we have to deal with Pence, all right, and then aspects of, of the government, which Pence doesn't know about, because Donald Trump doesn't know about. He's inexperienced. That's why he's bringing other inex inexperienced people to help right. run the government. Right. You understand right. what I'm saying? Right. It's that good old boys club. That's why they keep, keep talking about the GOP. Mm -hmm. The grand old party. The good old mm -hmm. boys club, man. That's mm -hmm. who these people are. So so when you say impeached, someone someone called me up and asked me, you know, do, do I think they're going to take them out? I'm like, well, first of all, I don't even talk like that on the phone because I know they're listening. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I said, um, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't call that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I don't have those kind of conversations on the phone. Because if you look at the president that they did shoot, we need to go back into it and look at it. That President uh, Lincoln had a chance to do it all over again with issuing greenbacks, messing with them people's money. I don't think they would have put a bullet in them. I think he would have thought through that. You understand what I'm saying? Right. If those Kennedy boys, they should, they, I, I think they might want to, if they had a chance to do it again, they would have thought through that. Reagan. All the ones they put bullets in, man. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're not afraid to kill their own. So when you talk about racism, white supremacy, someone said, one brother called me and says, Professor Good, isn't this a beautiful time, man? We get to see racism up front and up close. Racism is at war with itself in the White House. I'm like, what do you mean by that, brother? He says, man, the crackers be going at it and blah, blah, blah. This is a good time for black people to do this, this, this that, and the other. I said, don't you realize that black people are caught up into the affairs with white people? having to play out our liberation on Facebook? Mm. <laughs> so you're a high-brand revolutionary on Facebook. <laughs> mm. And you stick your chest out on Facebook and on YouTube thinking about you about a, to bring about a, a, uh, a revolution of the spirit, of the soul, and of the mind, tapping back into the ancestral realm and tapping back into the, some of those ancestors' um, and standing on the shoulders of the ancestors on Facebook, though. Mm -hmm. I said, nah, bro. No. We're meeting less in person. We have less contact with one another because of social media. We talk more stuff to one another because we can hide behind social media. You understand right. what I'm saying? We're not organizing like we should because we're on social media. And when we're on social media, we're not organizing like we should. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying some people aren't organizing because we are. But not like we did in day, back in the day. Right. We got together and we met with one another. We knew who one another were. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. Now, but because we have social media, we don't trust one another. We curse one another out at the drop of a hat because of the comma is misplaced or we didn't cross the T or dot the I. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Right, right. People think that we're, we're digital online beggars because we ask for donations. <laughs> We do this work, and people don't see half of what we do. But as soon as we ask for a donation or somebody to support a cause or whatever, we become digital um, beggars on, on, online. I hear all the stuff that they call us, man. Mm. And, 
and this is very real, brother. Rich, so we have to be able to understand the day and time that we're living in and what we're up against right now. For real. Or let me tell you something. Some white people right now, if you really look online, look, look real close and listen to them, the end back people, they said that they voted for Trump. I'm like, how are these people going to weather the storm? I don't care about none of the half the people that voted for him. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Right. If you ain't one of the pink people, man, they, he don't care about you like that. He'll pat you on the head like he's doing bend over cars with man and he's going about your business. They talk about making America great again. They talk about making America white again. And my final thing for tonight's show is, what period of time are you talking about making America great? When was America ever great? What period of time are you talking about? Give, pick, pick, pick 10 years, Brother Rich. Give me a 10-year period. How about 1950 to 1960? Was America great then, Brother Rich? <laughs> what was, if it was, what was the condition of black people? Tell me how great it was. Right, right. So what period of time is Donald Trump talking about? When was it great? When black people were enslaved? In slavery? When was it great, man? So this, this is a real, this, some real things that we need to think about. And I'm telling you, Brother Rich, we need to start studying more than ever. Not only studying, all right, we need to start making this stuff applicable to our lives every single day, life. And make it practical. We have to make this stuff practical. Plain and simple, man. Indeed. That's it, Brother Rich. And on that note, Professor Griff, uh, leave your contact info, man. Let them know what you got coming up. They haven't heard from you in a while. Let them know everything going on right now with Professor Griff. Well, since I had to do this dentist thing, man, I've been down. Uh, my show has been down, so... Uh, I will be on the air tomorrow night, along with doing this thing live with you tomorrow night. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm happy to say, man, that my niece actually just, from just having no knowledge of self, man, I'm really, really proud of her. My niece, Adia, and my niece, um, Aisha Ra, um, she's putting together this thing called um, the You Are Enough little conference that she's having. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, man, she's having... Um, me and Soleil come by and do some things for her. And that's on Saturday, February 25th, 2017, at, from 2 to 6. The, uh, Ma'at Body Therapy Holistic Health and Fitness Studio, 25 West Campbellton, uh, Campbellton Street, Fairburn, Georgia. It's free. Come on through. Me and Soleil are going to do a meet and greet, meet some people, and uh, we're going to do a mini kind of lecture kind of thing, making some things happen. We're doing this um, for my niece. Of course, Kumani are set. Uh, Angela Emery is going to be there with my niece, Aisha Ra. And um, I'm happy for her, man, because, you know, a lot of times you don't get family members, man. Normally you catch help from the family members. Yeah, you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. I'm yeah. glad to see her doing it, man. And uh, I got a couple of my brothers that constantly listen now. Um, they're fine-tuning their consciousness. I got a couple of uh, nephews that are listening. So people are coming around slowly but surely. And when I say that, I'm talking about... Uh, relatives, I thought would never come around, man. <laughs> mm. Okay. I thought would never come around. But, uh, thank you for all of the people that have sent me. A brother wrote me a beautiful letter, man, and sent me seven dollars, man. Rolled it up in some paper and put it <laughs> in the mouth. I was uh, like, wow, uh, man. I was like, I really thank that brother, brother Terrence, man. And I want to thank the sister from England that uh, that sent some donations in. All the people around the country that sent in. And the money to support, uh, support the cause. Thank y'all very much, man. I really, really, truly um, appreciate that, man, from everybody. But um, I'm, I'm still out. The artifactual film is being done. The last bit of editing is going to be done in March. It's going to be done in March, and the film should be released by then. So, yeah. Um, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, um, I'm out with Brother Khaled. Um, during these days, Kyla was on a 12-city tour. I knocked out four or five cities with him already. I'm just back on the road with him. I'll be on the West Coast. As a matter of fact, I'm doing something with Jordan Maxwell on Sunday, man. Oh, man. Um, at the Hilton. At the Hilton. At, LA, at LAX. Hilton. Right there at LAX this Sunday, I believe, at 6 o'clock. So if you're in L.A., come on by the Hilton at 6 o'clock at LAX. Um, be there with Jordan Maxwell. 
Sean Stone, Oliver Stone's son, and a couple of other people, man. Uh, well, I have my book on sale, Symbology. It's still on sale. People can still get it. They can go to my website, www.professorgriff.me, and order Symbology. All right, the book has been going well. Um, this is my third or fourth time kind of ordering it, Brother Rich, so people are definitely checking it out, man. Um, I'm developing the companion DVD to the book. So it's a beautiful thing. If you're in the Atlanta area, you can get the book at Madhu Bookstore at Greenbrier Mall, man. Everybody knew a Greenbrier Mall in the Swats, Southwest Atlanta Territory, man. They can get the book at uh, Greenbrier Mall at Madhu Bookstore, man. But people can call me, man, 678-557-2919. I'm going to see you tomorrow night, brother. Make it happen. Indeed. T- tell them how they could donate uh, your PayPal. Oh, yeah. All they got to do is go to my site, man. I put a donate button there on my website. They want to donate. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, moving up in the big leagues, man. I'm uh, red pill, black pill. They might even call me black pill or something. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, so it's a beautiful thing, man. Think, think, things are happening and it's on the move, man. Um, I got to get past the next couple of months dealing with this traveling and dealing with this weather because, you know, I don't dig the cold. I'm a summer baby, man. Yeah, yeah, you be telling me. <laughs> right. Oh, man. You know, and, and, and everybody, once again, we're, we're going to be back on the air tomorrow. We're going to be live 11 p.m. Uh, you can tune in. Go, go straight to the YouTube channel, and we will be airing live, and we will, we will be taking callers uh, toward the end of the show. Um, also, um, I'm joining face not Facebook, uh, Instagram and Twitter. So if you're on Instagram and Twitter and you want to get updates about what's going on with YouTube, and I'm also building a website to become more independent from these platforms, that's coming soon. But in the meantime, uh, make sure you check me out on Twitter and uh, Instagram, BlackMagic363, the same way you spell BlackMagic363. 